I gotta figure out which hat to put on now. You know, when Pastor uh, put out these assignments a few weeks ago, originally John was supposed to preach this morning, and I was supposed to do communion. I was so excited because I had this great idea for a communion message. And then John says, I'm not going to be here on Mother's Day. So I started flipping through Scripture, trying to get an idea, you know. And I came upon our story for today, and I thought, wow, even Jesus needed his mother. So the main scripture comes from Luke 2, 41 through 52, and I want to share that with you. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. And then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. And he said to them, Why are you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he had said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine favor. The word of God for the people of God. You know, in some traditions, Mary is so revered uh, as the mother of Jesus that it it seems hard to appreciate her task of simply being a mother to Jesus. I don't believe mothers are born knowing how to be good parents, or anyone else for that matter, yet instinctively mothers seem to want the best for their children. They want to make sure they're safe. They want them to grow up and be people that would make a difference in life. For better or for worse, our first impressions of parenting usually come from our parents. And the good news is we can learn and grow from that point. In Mary's case, she was greeted by an angel before she was married and told that she was going to bear a child that would be called the Son of God. There was angels singing and shepherds heard the angels and they rushed to where Mary and Joseph were and they told them of their encounter. And scripture says, Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. When you think about it, that's, you know, she's kind of trying to put all these pieces together. Babies hold so much promise and they bring such joy. And then the work begins. For all who love and nurture children, you know that it's a complete effort to invest the love and support and discipline needed to help a child grow and mature. And as Beth was saying, I mean, we have teachers, we have nurses, we have counselors, we have, we have police officers, we have firefighters, we have all kinds of people who are concerned and love children and nurture them. So keep those in mind as, as, we, as we go through these words today. You know, we're often surprised at how much our children can achieve and and how they've acquired the knowledge and skills that they some one day, you know, bring forth. Um, Joseph and Mary were devout Jews. And so, you know, Jesus was born a Jew, and they sought to bring him up in the ways of the faith. And so they took him to the temple for dedication. They've got these buttons all covered up. Which one am I supposed to do here? Whoops, going back. All right, so this is Mary, and she treasured them in her heart. And then the child grew and became strong. If you know the story of Simeon and Anna at at the temple, they were saying all kinds of things about this baby Jesus. And Joseph and Mary were were thinking, well, what what does all this mean? And Luke says in in the verse before our story, the child grew and became strong.
By all accounts, Jesus grew up um, as any child would in his day. There was nothing really special about it. Uh, He was attentive to the faith. His parents were trying to raise him in the faith. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that there were other scary moments other than the one in our scriptures. But, you know, we all can relate to those scary moments that happen when you're raising children. You know, uh, like those times when maybe a teenager doesn't answer their phone and they're kind of late and you're beginning to wonder what's going on. Well, such was the case for Mary and Joseph when they journeyed to the temple for that celebration when Jesus was 12 years old. You see, at the age of 12, a young man was coming of age and he was getting ready to take his place in the religious community. And no doubt these young men had been receiving some religious education and so forth. And so as the story goes, Mary and Joseph set out to return home. But what I learned was it's customary in those days for the women to set out early because they moved at a slower pace. And then the men would set out and they would meet at a prearranged place later in the, in the day near sundown to camp for the night. So it's, it's quite logical that Mary may have assumed that Jesus was with Joseph And Joseph may have assumed that he was traveling with some other relatives or friends. And so when they get, when they meet at the encampment and they start looking around, they can't find Jesus. And so, you know, it must have been a tense night because I'm sure at first light they set out to return to Jerusalem. And then when they got to Jerusalem, they're searching the city to try to find out where this boy is. And I can just imagine hoping and praying every minute that he's okay, that nothing bad has happened to him. If you've ever been worried sick about the welfare and whereabouts of a child, you can imagine how they felt. But you know, you don't have to be a mother to know this kind of fear. You can be a father, you can be a counselor. In my first position as Minister of Music, Youth and Educational Assistant, it's hard to get it on one business card, Um, I was serving a church of about 1,700, and uh, it was our youth's tradition to go to the Hinton Rural Life Center in North Carolina every year. And rural describes it. I don't know how it is today, but in those days, it was 20 miles or so to, to the nearest town in any direction. So there'd been some tension between some of the young men in the group, and um, I was sitting at breakfast. I can see the scene like it just happened. And one of the young men came and handed me a note. And I read the note. And the note said that this one young man had decided he was going to go home. And he had set out walking for a bus station. So you can imagine, immediately, I lost my appetite. There was a lump in my throat. The next thing I did was I called his parents, only to find out they knew of his plan and they said, we're okay if he wants to come home. We just don't want him wandering around in the dark on you know, country roads. So we sent a car to one direction where there was a bus station. And I climbed in a Jeep with a driver and we went to the other, uh, other direction. And miracle of miracles, when we got to the bus station, he was there. The long walk seemed to have taken a little bit of the edge off of him. And we talked a little bit. And he decided he would come back with us. More emotions, okay? And so, uh, poor guy, he was so tired on the way home, I was sitting in the back of the Jeep, and I had to keep propping him up into the seat because he'd be falling asleep and falling out of the seat. But, you know, when we got back, it was a change in the whole youth group, and they kind of reassessed some of their behaviors and the way they'd been treating each other, and they worked well for the rest of the week. You know, I've often said to uh, teenagers that I've counseled um, that I wish I could set up for them a a split screen. You know, because when they're late, the parents are walking and and they're worried and they're ready to make a deal with the devil, you know, if, if only that child would come home safe. And on the other side, you got this teenager hanging with his friend, enjoying life. You know, they come up to the door and in that moment, When the door is opened, for the parent, the fear goes to anger. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, no, you're not. You wait till I get finished with you. (laughs) 
Well, such was the case with Mary and Joseph. She said, child, why have you treated us like this? Can you imagine talking to Jesus that way? His mother, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety, with fear. You know, mothers worry about uh, worry out of their desire to ensure that their children are safe. And sometimes that desire is so driven by fear that children feel their mothers have become too controlling. And sometimes the child will get the wrong message that the parent doesn't believe they know that the parents know they can do anything or, or that they can figure it out on their own. But Jesus' response doesn't indicate that. It does suggest that he was coming of age and his human nature was beginning to understand the purpose that God had for him. His reply was, why are you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? If it's as if Jesus expected Mary and Joseph to remember all the things that had happened. The announcement of the angels, the, 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 the temple dedication with Simeon and Anna and all of these things. It's like he's saying, I'm sorry you're upset, but I'm studying the word. And then he, he referenced his father's house as the temple. Not his earthly father, but his heavenly father. In Luke's gospel, this, these are the first words of Jesus that are recorded. And they indicate at this young age that Jesus, the young man, was becoming aware of his unique relationship with God. I don't think Mary and Joseph really understood what was going on and probably were very confused. Scripture says that the young man was obedient and went down with them to Nazareth, was obedient to them. And again, his mother treasured all these things in her heart. You've heard phrases like that before. I, I think Mary believed that there was something special about her son but their life was just kind of plain and ordinary. They were just hardworking, ordinary people, trying to raise a child in, in, in the faith, trying to do the right thing, trying to keep them safe, trying to raise them upright. And you know, for all that we revere Mary, she was just a plain, simple young woman, doing the best she could. You know, the last verse in our scripture uh, really uh, stands out to me. I'll read that again for you. It's, it's the one that says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. You know, John's gospel tells us that Jesus was the Word and the Word was with God and, and was God from the beginning. And I got no question that the divine nature of Jesus is like that. But you know, theology teaches that there is the divine nature of Jesus and there's the human nature of Jesus that are as one. And so when the scripture says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, I believe it's implying that Jesus, the human side, had to grow and learn just as we do and have a mother and a, other parents and family around to nurture and teach them, to help them learn the ways of of the faith and how to, how to live a good and perfect life. And of course, Jesus lived it perfectly. So that's why I believe that even Jesus needed his mother. In the traditional view, um, we often associate women with the nurturing part and fathers with the discipline part. And Paul is, is recounting this, this uh, commandment uh, as he's uh, writing to the Ephesians. And he writes, uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, and honor your father and mother. And he adds, so that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Now, don't misunderstand that scripture. That's not giving you permission for anything, okay? It's not suggesting that if a child doesn't obey their mother and father, he may not live to adulthood, okay? It's not what it says. Because Paul follows that with, and fathers, we could say parents, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So raising children is about nurture. It's about love. It's about cultivating mutual respect. 
Any adult who cares for children should be, feel compelled to do these things, and always with respect. The trap I think that we fall into is a lot of times we feel like we should be respected because I'm your father, she's your mother, this is your teacher, this is your counselor, whatever it might be, because, because, because. Well, I think we earn that respect when we demonstrate that we are interested, that, that we have love and concern for one another. And I believe that when children know that we're there for them and we want the best for them, that we expect the best for them, that they will listen to us and what we have to say. Discipline is necessary and it must be fair, but it must be executed with compassion, not in anger. You know, I've said to my young clients in the presence of their parents, your parents' job is to teach you how to be responsible. Your job is to work them out of a job, to grow in wisdom and in stature. As a teenager, I was into riding horses and training horses and things like that, and so I often watch the agricultural channel on Sunday morning you know, love all these shows that come on. And now the, the trend in, in training horses is not breaking horses, but gentling horses. And the idea with a lot of these trainers is that they use a soft hand to earn the horse's trust and to get them to, to kind of want to do what they want them to do, to get them to want to obey them. Um, and you know, in my experience as a youth pastor and uh, as a choir director, uh, I found that this often works. And I think it works for a very important reason. It's biblical. God could make us do anything that he decided to do. And God gives us free choice. Because when we choose to do the right thing, to honor God, to follow God, he is glorified. It's really reminiscent of that, of that commandment, right? Honor your father and mother. Because by this, they are glorified if you will, glorified. So there are circumstances and there are consequences for bad choices. There's discipline for bad choices. And there's a process by which the relationship can be restored through, you know, contrition, restitution, repentance, and forgiveness, and that reconciliation and the restoration of the, the relationship can take place when we've gone astray. When we choose to honor and obey the Heavenly Father, He is glorified, reminiscent of that commandment. You know, Jesus honored His mother and Joseph as a young man. And as He hung on the cross, He even honored His mother. In those days, a woman really had no resources unless she was under the care of a man. And so as Jesus hung on the cross, John's Gospel tells us, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his own home. Mothering, parenting, working with children, any way you do it is hard. But I believe those that are patient and loving and who persevere usually find a reward at the end of the day to be honored for the sacrifices that they have made. And today, for all those women who love and care for children, we thank you and honor you for your love, for your sacrifice, and for your service. Happy Mother's Day. It's time now. You know, every year we do the Mother's Day recognition. So we're going to see... And maybe we could just raise our hand. It's, it's, you know, if we take and we stop and think, what is a mom worth? Well, a new study from salary.com calculates that if a stay-at-home mother were paid on the basis of their multiple responsibilities, guess what they would earn? Half a million. Not like that. I, they say $134,121 annually. Now, working mothers would earn $86,876 for the mom job portion, as well as whatever they make at their paying job, at their outside job. You know, it's 
stay-at-home moms and working moms do unbelievable things. And maybe the load is heaviest for single moms who do that mom work and, and some dad work too along with it. And there's over 10 million of those in the United States. Motherhood is a 24-hour-a-day job with no time off, and you get to be a teacher, a nurse, a chauffeur, a maid, a counselor, to name just a few. If you've ever served as a foster parent officially, or you've fostered a child by mentoring, by taking in a neighbor child, not necessarily to live with you, but to support and, and emotionally, perhaps financially, if you've taken in a child or mentored a child, raise your hand. And dads too, moms and dads, right? And that's a great gift. That's those, the mothers that we're talking about that um, are like surrogate mothers. They're like, that they support, that they're not biological mothers. They fu fulfill that mother role. Now, I want to get a couple other things, okay? Now, I want you to think about this. Have you ever, mothers, and in mentors, have you ever stayed up most of the night to help a child finish a school project, like a science project? Who has stayed up the latest? I have seen the sun come up, so I may win this. No, Kim, it wasn't for you. Okay. Have you ever learned in the evening at bedtime that your child needs two dozen decorated cupcakes or, or some other treat at 8 a.m. the next morning, what is the most complicated item or quantity that you've had to fit, had to prepare? Have you ever discovered, you know, it, and that's when you pray, Wendy, Dixie, please be, you know, please have my cupcakes. But, but what is the most complicated thing you've ever had to prepare for your child at the last minute? For, like, what? Oh, okay, yeah, that's the pro and I'm talking food. Now we're gonna get yeah, volcano too. That go with the projects. Staying up all night, the volcano. Yes, ma'am, Bill. A what? A costume. a costume, right? A costume. You you hear about it at eight, I think. Have you ever eaten a food that you, the food that your child leaves on their plate? Because we know if we eat what our child leaves on the plate, it has no calories, right? <laughs> So I wonder which mom has cleaned up the most food. And I could probably win that one, too. Um, have you ever said to your child, don't make me turn this car around? Or, or because I said so, that's why. So I wonder which one said the most. So those are just a few of the things mothers do for kids. And those of us who are grand, now listen to this, those of us who are grandmothers, you mothers will become, become grandmothers. Those of us who are grandmothers know just how fast that time flies. Too bad we can't save a little of that time with our little ones for later. But no worries, the grandchildren will come along, right? We do not realize all the things our mothers did for us until we start doing them for our own children. On this Mother's Day, let them know how much they are appreciated. We have some prayer requests. Uh, Patsy Page tells us that Sylvia Long is in bad condition at the hospital. And uh, that is Mr. Glenn Long's sister-in-law. Charlie and Beverly Smith share with us that um, have a praise. Um, for that we are keeping Wendy in our prayers, um, that her Wendy and her cancer in, her, in our prayers. She has completed five weeks of radiation treatment and sees the doctor on the 19th to prepare for surgery. Continue to keep her and her family in prayer. Also, a praise, Percy graduated from preschool. And it's wonderful to celebrate the goodness of our Lord. Uh, Randy's dad will have surgery at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, so we'll be praying for him. Um, Scott and Christine Bryant, and I know also Kim shared for the, the Glom family. Uh, we had a little girl, who, a middle schooler, who attended school here last year, who moved to Vail, Colorado. I'm sorry, Vail, Arizona. And she was found killed in... Um, in, in very suspicious circumstances, I think. 
and it was a good friend of Max's and Max's, my grandson's class, and it's a great loss, a very beautiful, lovely young lady, and we just um, pray for the family that they would find comfort and peace. Mr. Arnold is dealing with some cancer issues. She has the band instructor at West Nassau. Thank you. I mean at Callahan Middle. Forgive me. Callahan Middle. Yeah. Let's be in prayer. Gracious and holy God, there are so many things that happen in this world that are just beyond our understanding. And the first thing that comes to mind is why. And we search for those answers, and yet they're not to be found. There is sickness, there is loss, there is devastating circumstances that happen in this world. And the only thing that we know that is there for us always and in all times is your love and your presence. And we pray your holy presence and your love and your comfort to surround all of these that have been lifted up this day and that they may know that your grace and strength is available to them through all who minister to them and help us to be there for them as well in any case that can, we can we could come upon. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. Well, I hope that this will be a happy day for you. I know for some women they struggle on these days, but if you see one, give them a hug and encourage them because all women are, are helpful in the raising of children. And as you go from this place, spread the good news Spread the love of God, and as Pastor says, invite somebody to church. Thank you.